So our final uh, presentation today is by a team from Northwest Hydraulic Consultants in Seattle. Yeah. We'll say Seattle. Washington. Yeah. Washington. <laughs> be a little more general, <laughs> on um, approaches for simulating large woody material with two-dimensional models. Um, we have three authors on this. Um, our presenter, all three, our, all three okay, yeah. so um, Dr. Achilles Sakaris, um, Matt George, and Katie Moses. And in the interest of moving along, I'll just say there is lots of experience here in river engineering, habitat restoration, um, fish passage, stream processes, which is what modern AOP is all about. Um, so I think, as I said before, we're, we're getting to the point where large woody debris or large woody material, I guess, is the correct term these days. Um, it's going to become an engineering tool in design. And I think the challenge for DOTs is that we tend to want to stay within our right of way. We don't like to stick large objects either inside or right in front of or right behind the culvert. But um, who knows what happens. Thank you. Okay, so you guys are at the last presentation for today, so please stay awake as long as you can. Hopefully we'll engage you guys in this. Um, so my job today is just to give you a brief introduction, but Matt and Achilles are really going to go through the meat of kind of our presentation. As we all know, larger material does have an influence on hydraulics in a stream. Um, wood can create zones of increased and decreased velocities. Um, it can change flow paths. Wood can create just um, variable shear stresses and depths. And you know, stream restoration and you know, in general, larger material is becoming more common as just part of AOP projects in general. Washington State is doing that on most of our um, fish passage projects, and so we just, it's really important from an engineering perspective to understand that how wood can influence the hydraulics near your crossing so that you know that you're not creating an issue after construction. So, um, let's see if I can get to the... <clears throat> so this is just an example of some wood, natural wood we see on sites all the time in Washington. This is really common for us. Um, and as engineers, we like equations, we like things that are black and white, we like just a problem we can solve, and honestly, stream restoration and wood does not fit that very well. <laughs> so we're going to do our best to kind of put one box around larger material and what to do with design. Um, <clears throat> it's really important to note that so for us, like what we're going to be talking about today is putting um, large material into an SRH2D hydraulic model and different methodologies of how you can do that. And it's just really important to note that this is not a one size fits all. Every project should be looked at differently. You'll probably want to use a different method if you're using a single piece of wood versus a complex structure. Um, so we're just going to kind of go through the different methodologies, but just please note that this is not one size fits all. We don't expect that. Um, we would recommend before you even start incorporating wood into your 2D hydraulic model that you think about your specific project and what are you looking at to get out of the model. What's important to know? Is it important to know a change in flow direction? Is it important to know inundation limits? What are you looking for? And on top of that, what is reasonable for how detailed you can make your mesh. I mean, often we can't even get the amount of detail in a mesh and get the model to run stable to incorporate wood successfully. So you just want to think, take all of that into consideration before you even get started. So um, Achilles is going to go through kind of a short um, review of just the effects of wood on hydraulics. It's just some construction examples. Um, and then kind of go through the different methodologies for putting it into SRH2D. And then Matt will go through some differences of those different mo um, methods as an example. So with that, I'll turn it over to Achilles. Thank you, Katie. So the first question that someone will ask me is, uh, why do we care really to model, uh, to incorporate the effects of uh, large woody material in uh, 2D hydraulic models? And the answer is that simply that uh, they affect uh, almost every single aspect of the uh, riverine system. Uh, for example, uh, this, uh, rec this recent research showed that uh, large woody material, oh, pardon me, uh, large woody material can uh, diffuse and introduce lags in uh, hydrographs routed uh, through uh, reaches with uh, ubiquitous uh, large woody material. Uh, also, as we probably all understand, uh, large woody material can uh, 
uh, can increase inundation extents, which is uh, very important for uh, floodplain delineation. Uh, as, it is, it, as it has been known for quite some time, and uh, you see here this paper by uh, Manga and Kirchner from 20 years ago, uh, they found that uh, large woody material, so this uh, curve light right here, can be up to, uh, can bear shear stresses three times three times larger than uh, the shear stresses that are uh, captured by the, uh, uh, by, by the channel bed, especially in cases where you have uh, highly, have this large woody material in high densities, uh, the x-axis is essentially, the, the L is uh, the spacing between these uh, large woody material elements. And uh, as uh, it is intuitively known, large woody material is uh, ultimately an obstruction and it creates a very uh, a highly diverse uh, flow field as it was uh, initially visualized by the seminal work of Abbey and Montgomery in 1996. Uh, so we have uh, flow deceleration and reversal. Uh, we have uh, uh, flow accel acceleration on the uh, laterally uh, from uh, a in-stream uh, large woody material piece. We have like development of horseshoe vortices, shear layers, so a very, uh, very complicated uh, flow field. And uh, when you have uh, <coughs> more uh, when, you have, when you have large woody material protruding in, laterally into your flow. Uh, as uh, this more recent research has shown, you have uh, backwater effects, you have uh, potentially plunging flow when uh, floods get uh, deeper, uh, you have uh, uh, upwelling and which causes the formation of uh, you know the wood, what we call as the wood force pool. So a very a lot of effects in uh, the flow hydraulics that uh, we should all be interested in. Uh, also, large woody material uh, affects uh, the, morpholo the morphology of streams and uh, sediment transport process. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the wood force pools uh, here you can see in the uh, uh, in Tamwater Creek, which is uh, just. Uh, south of uh, Port Angeles, Washington, uh, upstream of uh, Highway 101. You have like uh, a, a very nice wood forced pool by these two uh, uh, logs projecting into the creek. And at the same time, uh, wood can uh, uh, serve as a uh, big regulator of uh, sediment transport patterns. Uh, for example, this is uh, from Ennis Creek, again, near Port Angeles. Uh, <coughs> So as you can see here, the, uh, the obstruction caused by this wood jam has ag aggraded uh, so much bed material. As a matter of fact, for this creek, uh, because it brings uh, a lot of uh, quantities of uh, uh, wood and uh, sediment from upstream, actually the wood uh, is causing uh, downstream sediment starva starvation issues. Uh, so very important to account for the wood. Now the next question would be, uh, yes, uh, Achilles, how can I go about uh, including this uh, stuff in my uh, 2D hydraulic model? And uh, so far there is like, uh, there is a suite of uh, methods that, a lot, that we have uh, at least used uh, to do that with uh, varying degrees of uh, success, may I add. Uh, so at, at its most simplest form, uh, large wood material effects could be accounted for with uh, and uh, by adjusting the uh, uh, hydraulic roughness, or I'll just call it uh, Manning's N uh, for the rest of the presentation since that's the most common. Uh, so we can adjust Manning's N at the over the reach scale, so basically it's in, and we'll see how that will be done. Uh, we can account large woody material by adjusting the uh, Manning's N locally, so uh, near in the vicinity of the uh, large woody material structure. Uh, Large woody material could be represented uh, computationally in the form of an additional drag force, which is basically what the SRH to the obstruction uh, coverage does. Uh, or uh, when we get, uh, now we're getting a little bit into the more complicated stuff, uh, large woody material can uh, be directly incorporated in your um, uh, 2D model mass geometry, or it could even uh, be simulated uh, 
in the, essentially in the form of uh, infinite vertical walls under certain circumstances, which is essentially by removing some uh, mesh elements. Uh, now, a silent assumption here that I should mention is, uh, like Katie mentioned, uh, the, uh, especially for the uh, methods four and five here, uh, the mess of uh, the hydraulic model should be uh, should be defined such that it allows doing that. And uh, to put it very simply, uh, simply when you have like uh, 50 foot elements, is not like possible to incorporate one foot long uh, logs into the mess. Um, or uh, there can be a combination of uh, all of these uh, methods, or or of some of these methods. Uh, now, uh, the simplest of all, like I said, is a global mining zen adjustment. Uh, it's very uh, fundamental, like uh, based on the uh, principle of roughness su superposition. So basically, you uh, uh, consider the additional roughness caused by your uh, obstruction or your large woody material elements, and you add it to uh, your basic mining zen, so your bed mining zen, and uh, get a higher. Uh, so how much? Uh, well, um, Joachim in 2018 compiled this table and provides uh, a range of uh, uh, anticipated increases uh, for Mannings N when, uh, uh, when including large woody material depending on their density. Uh, so ranging from basically nothing to about 0.05. Uh, whereas uh, Rasse more recently uh, found that uh, his best results were with by increasing uh, the channel bed mining zone by about 30%. Uh, so when is this uh, method really good to use? Uh, really when uh, uh, <clears throat> you want to treat a uh, stream reach as a, in some ways as a black box. So for instance, uh, in this uh, unnamed tributary of Downs Creek, you see how much uh, how the stream looks, there is like massive quantities of wood and basically they're covering the stream. Uh, so uh, in this case, it was impossible to go and survey every little uh, piece of wood. So in this case, we chose to uh, add, to bump up the Manning Zen in this upstream reach of, of the creek. This is the, uh, the light blue color here. Uh, so we bumped it by uh, up by 0.03 based on the uh, Yohum recommendation. Uh, <clears throat> the next method uh, was to locally adjust Manning Zen. So this is uh, some proposed uh, large woody material structures that uh, uh, are to be constructed on Perdi Creek near the town of Perdi in Washington State. Um, so in this case, these uh, these large woody material structures were, uh, were simulated by uh, increasing the Manning's roughness at the location of these structures. And you will see here, this is the, uh, the brown color here. Uh, following, uh, Ras uh, Rasetol did uh, quite a bit of uh, research on that and suggested uh, ranges of values uh, between 0.19 and 0.29. And I know some of you people are cringing uh, listening to these numbers, but uh, that's what they found. <laughs> uh, and uh, one important detail to uh, note here is that in this application, uh, we chose to make a essentially a ring around all of these uh, large woody material structures with slight, slightly less Mannings N, but higher than the adjacent bed, just to uh, account for uh, secondary uh, sources of roughness such as branches and uh, root wads that these uh, logs typically have, uh, but also to help a little bit the model to uh, uh, help the model with the huge jump in roughness from the ambient bed to the uh, much higher roughness of the uh, large woody material elements. Um, in, in another project, uh, this is the uh, Tianaway River uh, near Klee Elam, uh, Washington. Uh, there is uh, like uh, large woody material incorporated into a, uh, into a revetment. And in this case, uh, these uh, uh, large woody material elements, they were essentially um, represented as uh, computational obstructions uh, within SRH2D. So you see that uh, these 
uh, red lines that represent the, the center line of uh, its constructed structure and an appropriate uh, drug coefficient and a porosity was, uh, was uh, introduced for these, uh, as well as the uh, necessary geometry to account for those. Uh, then moving on to the more complicated stuff, this is again uh, the uh, uh, constructed wood uh, at the unnamed tributary to Downs Creek, you see here. Uh, and in this case, the large woody material was uh, simulated but was directly incorporated into the mass geometry and you will see in uh, this uh, oblique view how these uh, uh, how the mass elevations uh, at the location of the large woody material elements were raised to the anticipated elevation of the top of these elements after uh, construction um, so essentially, the good thing with this method is that it directly accounts for the uh, form drag that, the, uh, that these uh, structures uh, are anticipated to have. But uh, on the downside is that essentially uh, it uh, neglects any pores, any flow that goes uh, through these uh, uh, large woody material structures, which in some cases uh, it uh, may not be trivial. Uh, and another thing to note here is that uh, when large woody material uh, is uh, incorporated into the mesh, that could potentially have some implications on uh, uh, where the f inundation extents are, which could be relevant in cases where uh, floodplain delineation is uh, the goal of the study and should be uh, accounted for uh, by, the, uh, by, by the engineer. Uh, for example, here you see uh, the green line shows the mass uh, for the previous project at Downs Creek, uh, and then that is, and the uh, cyan line here is the water surface elevation. Uh, if we had used, a, say, a Manning's roughness approach, uh, then my, the inundation limits would be a little bit further out. So that's a uh, judgment call, unfortunately, that the uh, designer has to make. Uh, again, uh, for the Perdi Creek, uh, an alternative way was essentially to uh, simulate uh, these uh, large woody material structures as uh, uh, you know, uh, infinite vertical walls, um, which essentially is by removing the, e the mess elements uh, from where these uh, logs were located. Uh, and this is actually uh, a good method when uh, you're anticipating uh, relatively low flow depths uh, in comparison to the, uh, uh, to the uh, large woody material sizes. Uh, but again, uh, like the previous method, it has the, uh, it has the problem that it does not account, uh, it does not account at all for any porous flow through uh, through these structures. Uh, you are able, however, to get a much better or uh, I should say more uh, aggressive uh, estimate of the change in the uh, uh, velocity vector directionality, which, for example, some roughness methods have a little bit more harder time uh, to do as uh, Matt is gonna show here pretty shortly. And I will hand it over to him. All right, thanks Achilles. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so we wanted to also include a simple uh, modeling exercise uh, to go through and show all of these methods that Achilles just described in a way that you could see the relative difference of the differences for them rather than um, going through the results of separate projects where we, we use certain methods on, methods on some and didn't use some on, on others. So to do that, I set up a very simple um, uh, surface that I could build into a simple hydraulic SRH2D model um, using SMS. So to do that, it was just this, this standard typical section here with about a 10 foot bottom width, a 16 foot top width, you can see the dimensions there, and then these uh, essentially a flat um, floodplain overbank area extended out to, to cover the whole uh, area that would get inundated by, by this model. Um, I set it up to be 500 feet long and set it to 1% slope. So here is what the mesh actually looks like. It's just uh, patched 
uh, elements in this case, no paving. Um, the, the, the sizes of the elements in the channel is two foot by one foot and then just a little bit different in the floodplain, two foot by 1.33 feet. Um, here is what the boundary conditions look like for that. Flows from left to right. Uh, that thick blue line is the inflow boundary condition and this was run in steady state. Uh, so it was just a constant 140 CFS throughout the simulated uh, or the simulation time of two hours. Um, and then the exit boundary condition is the thick orange line on the right side and that was set at a constant uh, water, water surface value um, that was near normal depth. I did some sensitivity on that to make sure the results weren't affected um, in, the, in the center of the mesh which is where you'll see the, the wood that gets put into this model is at. Uh, this is what just the basic materials coverage looks like, very simple, just the channel and a floodplain value. So 0.035 in the channel, 0.06 for the floodplain is what I chose. And then um, moving on to where that wood is, we, so we've got a zoomed in display here. Uh, you can see these are the, so the pink graphics here are the, the LWM structures that get put into this very simple um, model. And so let me step forward. So here's an example of the local uh, Mannings and increase. So those are the, 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 the six light brown patches um, throughout the channel. In this case, used a, a end value of 0.15 for those. So I'm going to step through all the methods and then I'll get to the results at the end. Um, so here's an example of the global end value increase. So just this entire area was bumped up. You can see here 0.065 in this case. Um, and then here's an ex here is how the obstruction line coverage method was set up for this. Uh, the light gray uh, squares in the background, those are the elements from the mesh. The black lines are the, uh, the break lines in the channel. So the center one is the thaw leg and then the toe bank, top of bank outside of that. And the pink lines are the actual obstruction lines used to represent the wood. Um, I, I set the thickness just at 20 feet just to be above the, the modeled water surface value. Um, did some sensitivity on one below that but it wasn't in this case because uh, the water depth is not very much in this model. It, there, there wasn't much of an impact so it just one with one that extended above. Um, okay, now this is the method, this is a view of the mesh now with the elements uh, turned off but the, the lines represent the elevation contours in the mesh. So you can see the, each of these protrusions throughout represent uh, the, those elements being raised to represent the, the logs. And then there's an example, just if I flip back and forth you can see they're in the same spot. And then likewise with removing those elements from the mesh entirely was the last uh, technique. So getting into the model results now, I've got water depth and velocity. Um, so flows from left to right on all of these. You can see, I mean as expected, uh, the, the floodplain width is increased by, the, by all these methods. Uh, causes the water depth to rise right with the increased uh, roughness values uh, or the, the drag force applied from the obstruction line method. And then moving on to these last two. So again the top left is the version with no wood and then top right was with the, the, some of the elements being raised to represent the wood and then the bottom right is with the elements being removed from the mesh. So in particular you can see on these ones, especially with the elements being removed from the mesh of course, the, these, these darker hot spots, the red values, the increased water depth upstream of each of those, uh, similar to what Katie was describing um, with the pools upstream of wood that we observe in nature. And then moving on to the velocity results, this is zoomed in a bit more so you'd hopefully see uh, the flow vectors. Um, they seemed much larger when I was saving them out. <laughs> from SMS, I'll apologize, but um, you can at least see the, the, the hot spots in front of the wood structures in many of these and then the bit of the velocity shadow behind those, um, the, the LWM structures. And this is especially apparent again in the version removing the elements from the mesh. Uh, you have these, this recirculation behind those, velocities dropping to near zero in that velocity shadow um, and then increased velocities in front of them. And then just to touch on something Achilles mentioned with plunging flow over wood that's apparent in this version of the model with the, the elements being raised in the mesh with these hot spots uh, because in, the, in this case the, the flow did overtop those so that's what each of these hot spots is, was the flow coming over, over that in the mesh. Um, and then lastly I wanted to 
I just wanted to include some numbers at least so you could see that relative to, to what you were just seeing with those other graphics. So in this case, um, I'm not, I'm not going to describe everything here, but I mean, you can see the floodplain width increase by including the, the wood. Um, this is not to say that if you include wood in your projects, you're going to have triple or quadruple the inundated area. This scenario was obviously set up to be able to show the different modeling techniques and what the impact could be in a super simple case. Um, so, yeah. Lastly, just wanted to, to summarize that, you know, including LWM in models can be necessary depending on your project, as we've talked about, very project specific, uh, but it is complicated. Um, uh, and it's going to re require lots of engineering judgment to, to consider the different options you have and evaluate the best method to do that. So with that, I'm going to say thank you and invite Katie and Achilles back up and we can take any questions. Could you go back to that table like one or two slides back? Yeah. So, the mesh removed seems, the other ones are all more or less consistent. Mm -hmm. But when you remove the mesh, that seems to be a real outlier. Yeah. Um, you mean with like it dropping down to zero, no, essentially? No, well, looking at the floodplain width, for instance. Oh, okay. Yeah, so this just gets to, part, partly what Achilles was saying was that method in particular completely prevents any flow going through that area where the wood structure is being modeled. So the putting the, if I just skip back here, putting the holes in the mesh in these areas is just, is just raising the water even higher and pushing it out even further. Is that a good reason not to consider that approach then? Um, I would say it just depends on the context. For example, there are some projects where we're designing or there are these large wood structures that actually extend above the water surface. Um, and are intended to function to deflect the flow. So we've evaluated a few different ways looking at it without and then with and then considering all those results uh, to see how we want to proceed. Well, I would say if you have a high risk site where maybe it's, there's a home pretty close to your bank or something like that and you are intending to put a pretty big structure, you might want to evaluate even a lower flow event, I was touching on this earlier, because with that, that modeling scenario, because if you get that flow direction and maybe increased velocities in a way you would necessarily want, um, it'd be important to understand that. So, so that's like a worst, worst yes. case. Any more questions? With your element raised mesh, did you tinker with the end value on the large weight material in addition to raising it? Or did you just leave it in, in this case, yeah, I didn't mess with that. But yeah, we have done that, I think. One of the examples Achilles described, we did raise it and also apply uh, the roughness increase. Yeah. Did you uh, do any sensitivity as far as mesh element size relative to the large wood size? Any recommendations? Number of elements? <laughs> um, I mean, with, with this example, I didn't, didn't do anything like that. It was just really simple, straightforward. Um, but I guess this just gets back to what Katie was saying at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> so that it, I go ahead, Achilles. In the, in the future, something in the future. Well, I think that what matters, I mean, we're all kind of saying the same thing, what matters is that you're only going to apply this, like, for example, if you have a two-foot piece of wood and your cell sizes are twice that or more, you're applying that, whatever method you're using, to a much bigger area than your wood is actually accounting for. So that really matters. So. I mean, yes, we have. We've looked at that. And like with the obstruction lines, too, like where you place that depends on what elements it's touching. So you've got to take that into consideration before you even consider putting wood in your model. Because if your element sizes are much larger than your wood, then it's going to have a much more exaggerated effect than is, is probably real. So we've, we've done it where we've you know trimmed down the mesh quite a bit in the vicinity of the wood to try to better represent what we were trying, showing. But that can create model issues and instability. You got to be careful with that if your mesh is too fine. So it's, it's not an easy thing, <laughs> for sure. You know, if you it's not here. Don Wise working on this at Casper Security. Ah, should be awesome. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
I think the biggest takeaway that we just wanted to share is that it's, it's not a black and white issue and it's something that we should be paying attention to when you're doing design because wood does have an influence and can, I mean I've seen it where people have placed wood upstream of a structure and you get flow direction in a way you weren't expecting and you can direct it right at a bridge abutment and you know have quite a bit of scour. So that's why you want to pay attention to this kind of stuff and as one of the tools we're using more readily is this, you know, SRH2D modeling or any 2D modeling for fish passage structures that you should just think about that for all your projects about, am I incorporating this, should I incorporate this, and how should I do that? So I have one, one last question here. Yeah. Katie, maybe you can answer it. You mentioned that WashDOT is actually requiring large woody material on projects. I would say requiring, it's not requiring. Encouraging. But it, yeah, I mean there's... There's just more effort in general the whole state, not so DOT. So are these on rich projects or even culver projects and how far away from the structure are you supposed to be sitting right there? I'm encouraging or we're requiring, but we are being the Manning's end stuff because there's a lot of, yeah, as everybody knows, a lot of research going on and a lot of different ideas on how best to represent that. Okay, well, thank you.